So Dr. Aurora is a physician at the University of Chicago Medicine and works at the, as the Assistant Dean for Scholarship and Discovery and is the Director of GME Clinical Learning Environment uh, Innovation. She wears many, many hats. Um, so as an academic hospitalist, she specializes in improving the learning environment for medical trainees and the quality and safety and experience of care delivered to hospitalized adults. Uh, she is an internationally recognized expert on patient handoffs in healthcare and also has extensive expertise in using technology such as social media to improve the workplace learning and teaching hospitals on a variety of topics. Through her leadership roles, Dr. Aurora enables incoming medical students to participate in longitudinal mentored scholarly projects. She is also working to ensure residents from all specialties are integrated into hospital quality initiatives. Um, as an accomplished researcher, Dr. Aurora has developed tools to evaluate handoff quality among hospitalists and residents. She also is investigating the effect of sleep loss on hospitalists hospitalized patients and working to create novel interventions to optimize patient experience in hospitals through workplace learning and systems change. Uh, through some of her grant funding, she's currently studying the impact of novel social media intervention to boost uh, interest of minority youth in medical research careers. Uh, Dr. Aurora's Academic work has resulted in more than 75 peer-reviewed publications and has been recognized with awards from the Society of Hospital Medicine, Society of General Internal Medicine, Association of Program Directors of Internal Medicine, and the Association of American Medical Colleges. She has also testified to Congress on the primary care crisis as well as to the Institute of Medicine on residency uh, duty hours and handoffs, which is I think a fantastic way to segue into today's conversation. Um, so I think, Dr. Aurora, could you tell us a little bit about how you got started on your activist journey? Yeah, no, I think that's a great uh, segue because uh, most of what uh, I think, you know, in like your personal bio is sort of your day job, as you will, and um, I'm imagining many of you guys kind of, uh, you know, working in your day jobs and also figuring out how can you make a difference nationally on issues that you care about. And so uh, we need tools to do that. And I think that I was fortunate in the sense that I really sort of rode this wave in 2009. I joined Twitter and I was one of the early doctors on Twitter. And, um, you know, what led me to do that? I've always been interested in technology and particularly learning for people. I should say that I do have a policy degree, so I, uh, I don't think you have to have a policy degree, but if you do have one, it's sort of, you know, it's like an, it's a signal that you might be interested in something more than your day job in uh, healthcare. And, um, and, and what the policy degree did was it exposed me to people like lawyers and um, educational people, uh, people in, uh, you know, transportation sector, all sectors that were kind of in how that relates to health. And so um, I took classes with people who, you know, after I trained as a physician, I took classes with people who actually viewed health as patients. And so I think that's had a really impactful, um, you know, been very impactful on my career. Um, but I mentioned that I left my policy degree and started back in academic medicine on more of a traditional academic journey as a researcher and as an educator, um, I sort of missed that. And so one of the ways that I found um, to really re-engage in that side of myself was really through social media because I could follow policymakers, I could use hashtags to tweet about healthcare policy. And so I would say that my activist journey started out uh, really as um, somebody who was in, um, you know, kind of in the, you know, in my own job, like seeing patients, seeing uh, seeing trainees, but also having a desire to actually reach beyond that and say, well, there's the patient in front of me that's hitting the ER because their diabetes is not controlled or their hypertension is not controlled. But then there's sort of the policy issue of like. Is it that we pay more for a diabetic to get amputation as opposed to pay a primary care physician to control their diabetes? And so that was something that really influenced me. Um, so I was sort of a 
sort of grew up in the organized medicine movement through American College of Physicians. Uh, but again, that was all really things that I did during training and sort of how do you integrate that as a practicing professional, um, somebody trying to, you know, also, do, you know, have a life and have work-life balance. I would have really found social media to be that key tool that enables me to do that. And I'd be happy to talk about that a little bit further, but want to pause there um, uh, to see if there's other questions that, um, that you guys have. Yeah, let's open it up to everyone who's joined here. Uh, certainly, if you have a question, please unmute your phone and um, ask away. And Dr. Aurora, uh, this is Robert Ferguson. I um, have a question about a uh, given that every week there's a new uh, change in health uh, policy. How do you figure out when you lead from where you sit or when you tweet something or, or when you think it, it might be best uh, to hold off? Yeah, no, that is a great question. And I would say that um, We've, you know, as a physician, it's interesting because I also have to, we all have to remember when we tweet, we're not just tweeting for ourselves. Uh, that's, a, that's a professional image. And, you know, I happen to be a doctor, so I have to think about that. I have to think about the fact that I represent University of Chicago, even though I have a disclaimer. Uh, you know, we all have seen stories of, you know, doctors getting in trouble. Um, and similar for all of you as working in your, you know, you're, you're an employee, but you're also, so you're representing your uh, firm or your foundation, um, but you also have an agenda. And so, um, so I think that's really important because uh, in today's political environment, and I will say like uh, post-election, post let, me, let me start at at least how did I get into this. Um, one of the things that I started doing was sort of experimenting. Well, you know, how do I experiment with my voice? And I realized that if I, you know, if I tweet about policy issues that aren't really core to my identity as a doctor, it doesn't really get a lot of pickup. I mean, I might sort of be uh, retweet and amplify a voice of somebody else if they have an issue related to education policy, which I'm interested in. I mean, I'm a mother. I, you know, have a uh, brother who's disabled who's benefited from the ADA and a variety of other, you know, uh, educational, uh, you know, public education initiatives. Um, but again, I'm, that's more of me as a person. Uh, the things that really amplify and pick up are me speaking about issues from my expertise. And so um, I think the more that you can align your voice with what you're doing, it's important. And so, um, so in that vein, um, you know, a while ago, uh, you know, because I was an early tweeter, kind of arrived at the scene early, you kind of get asked to be an expert. And so I've been asked to draft, you know, social media policy papers about how doctors should engage. But I've also been asked by a variety of people, including Vivek Morthy, the former Surgeon General who, before he was Surgeon General, was Executive Director of Doctors for America, to, um, to highlight, well, how can I help structure a Twitter campaign around positive messages around the Affordable Care Act um, during the um, during the Barack Obama's re-election, uh, particularly during the debates, just because the as you guys know, the ACA has been a hot button issue, and so uh, rightfully so, uh, the Democrats were imag imagining that that was going to be an issue, especially skyrocketing premiums. How do you message as a doctor that this is good for patients? And so. So I helped organize the Twitter campaign for that, um, and it was really impressive. You know, it's like first time doctors out in practice were like getting on Twitter. Uh, no matter how many followers you're on, you may have that, like just starting out, we were saying, here, please tweet these tweets. Here are some model tweets. Please retweet, um, use this hashtag. And that really started a movement. And so that, you know, and I met a lot of people through that movement. Um, and that's what's interesting about social media is you get to know people um, and you, you're, you're from, it's, you can engage in this from far away and your voices can really amplify. And it appears like a whole, oops, I'm sorry, it appears like a whole community of people are, um, you know, are, are working together. And so, um, so I think that I kind of found my voice through that. So I always say, like, pause before posting. You've got to find your voice, kind of dabble a little bit. And now let's talk about post-election. So post, you know, this last election in 2016, I would say that um, 
gosh, you know, just thinking about the executive orders, there's been news every day, and you're like, you know, you, we all have jobs. Like, how can you keep up? And so what I've chosen to do is kind of use, stay true to my voice and say, well, how can I make an impact directly on this conversation? And so if it directly impacts what I tweet about, medical education, patient safety, quality of care, healthcare access, I can actually have a voice women's health, uh, but if it's something a little bit off, it's going to be harder for me to tweet about something like, you know, the Russian investigation, you know, because it doesn't really carry a lot with the followers that I have. That's not to say that I'm not interested. I might, you know, occasionally retweet something or favorite something, but that's not part of my core message. So. I can give you an example, which is that when the um, – and, and, you know, you have to look for the tie-in. So when the immigration ban first uh, – the travel ban first hit, uh, you know, people were still scrambling for, like, well, what do – you know, what do we say? What do we do? Um, and I knew that most um, – 50 percent of um, physicians in residency training in internal medicine and family medicine are international medical grads. And so I knew that we were going to have program directors of my community struggling with this, like, right before match. And so um, I had seen some discussions on list hosts about it, like what are we doing? Um, and then a good friend of mine happened to be the program director at Cleveland Clinic, and um, her resident was stranded on, on a, trying to get back to the U.S. from vacation for her shift, and she couldn't do it. She was told to go back, and actually asked at the in the moment to sign, you know, sign away her uh, her her visa, and um, and so. Cleveland Clinic was helping her out, uh, but at the same time, the story was just got picked up, and so that's when I was like, okay, it's time for us to mobilize, time for us to really get our voice out there, because as medical educators, we can highlight that these international doctors actually provide a huge service to underserved communities, many in rural areas, who benefit from these doctors, and in fact, often are in red states. Uh, the other thing that I do is lead from where you stand. So I happen to be a board member at the American Board of Internal Medicine, and so use all the leadership and connections you have. And so I was actually, it was, you know, sometimes ideas hit you in funny places, and for me sometimes it's in the shower because that's when I can, you know, like I can shut out my family and think for a moment. And so I thought to myself, you know, that morning I thought, oh, my gosh, I wonder if the ABIM has statistics, numbers that they can apply. Learn that a lot. Like, the more you can bring numbers into the discussion, uh, you know, costs, numbers, how many patients are affected, that really carries. So I actually emailed the head of the American Board of Internal Medicine, the CEO, and said, hey, you know, um, I think that we might be in the position to supply some numbers about the number of of residents that are affected by this in internal medicine. And they mobilized very quickly and put out a statement that said this many residents were affected, um, and not only that, we estimate that it, they care for this many patients. And so um, pretty soon that got picked up. It was the most uh, retweeted and shared post the American Board of Internal Medicine had ever put out. So, um, so it really not only had impact for um, for our community, but it also had impact for the board as a group that was really, you know, out there trying to really get the message across that we care about our diplomates. Um, and I think that that was an important, so, it was a, it, so that was important. And the other thing that I will highlight is it showed other physicians, especially residents, that it's okay to take a stand. Uh, it's okay to stand with our colleagues on issues that affect us and affect our patients. And I highlight that because a lot of people post-election, especially in the medical field, are like, what's appropriate? You know, and I think, you know, we're all wondering, what is appropriate these days? And so I think that, um, but especially for those that work in healthcare, you're always trying to, you know, project your professional image. And so you're like, well, you know, can I go out there and retweet this or can I do that? And the key is if you're on, if you're on point, on message and on mission, you're going to be, and if it's something that you would go and stand and protest for, why not say it on Twitter, right? Because pretty much somebody could snap a photo of you at a protest. Um, and so that's been the kind of litmus test that I use, as hopefully that helps people think. I realize there's a lot of fear um, initially with using social media this way, so I always say when you first start, it's okay to have a little bit of caution and sort of err on the side of lurking and watching, uh, which I still do. I favorite a lot of tweets that I'm like, oh, you know, what's this developing conversation going on around 
you know, the uh, this or that, um, and then especially not in healthcare, more in education policy because I follow that on the side. Um, but then if it affects health, you know, disabled kids, I can stand up and say something about that. And so I look for the tie-in so that I can amplify my voice, if you will. Um, another example is um, gender equity in medicine. I've done a lot around, uh, you know, you know, activism around gender equity in medicine. And, um, and so if something is said or done that affects women, particularly women in medicine, I, I often will add my, you know, add my voice to the fray uh, because that's something where I know that my voice matters because I'm a woman leader in medicine and so, so that's gonna be something that we'll carry. Um, but I would say that, uh, you know, I always tell people when you start out, you know, get to know yourself, right? And especially if you're earlier in your career, it may take a while to find your voice. And it took me a little while, too. Uh, but it's always, always good to also favorite or follow people that you think you would like to be someday. And so, uh, so I routinely, you know, people that have inspired me are people like Bob Wachter, who's the, you know, leader in the patient safety hospitalist movement. And... Um, and so I kind of look, well, what's he saying about this? You know, you know, is, well, you know, what are my role models saying? And oftentimes I see, like, when I feel the urge to say something, they're saying something too, and that makes me feel a little bit like I'm standing on the right side. Thank you. That was great. Um, I Actually, I love the little anecdotes that you throw in there. Um, it really, you know, makes it feel that, you know, at, at any point in our career, you know, we encounter similar things and um, kind of gives us an example to, to say, that could be me as well, and that's great. Um, yeah, no, and I do, I do want to add, there are a lot of reporters on Twitter, and so just to round out the story, you know, my friend from Cleveland Clinic could not talk to reporters because they were under strict, you know, attorney gag order while they were negotiating the deal. So I had emailed her because a reporter had direct messaged me and said, hey, I need to speak to somebody about this. And I said, I'll try to get her in touch with you. She was like, I can't, but you do it. And so then I was able to, you know, amplify her voice at a time when she could not, you know? Right. I was actually, that kind of touches on the question that I was going to ask you next, sort of what are the challenges that you've encountered uh, along the way, because like like we kind of mentioned earlier, you went all the way to Congress to testify, but what are some of the, the bumps along the road that you've encountered where, you know, sort of like your friend who wasn't able to speak out, but you were able to speak out for her? Um, I don't know if you could talk on that a little bit. Yeah, so I would say that 100, so, so there's some several major challenges. One is time, and so, uh, and I'm going to be really honest, I mean, uh, you know, when you're when you're slugging it out in direct care these days, uh, it's really really hard. And so um, I just finished two weeks of inpatient service, and somebody, you know, even my mom follows me on Twitter. She's like, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "I'm in service. I'm really knee deep with the patients, um, and that's appropriate." Um, I had a lot to say, but I I wasn't able to express it in a way that was thoughtful and um, also because of some HIPAA issues, I, I wouldn't want to compromise my patient's privacy or standing, uh, but I was able to reflect and take notes and think, well, what, what, you know, what blog post might I write about this event you know, that I experienced in the hospital? So a little bit of distance and time helps from reflecting, um, especially if you're in the blogging space. Uh, the next thing is that it's really easy to get misinterpreted in 140 words. And so even small things, you know, I mean, there's always people out there. And so, you know, um, you know, I said something like, you know, recently I said something like, oh, you know, um, for trainees. I mean, it was just like a, you know, I'm on a board about from that's federally funded agency for healthcare research and quality to collect patient safety cases for reflection, and they give $300 of your cases selected. And so I said, dear trainees, submit case patient safety case, and if you win, $300. And somebody else wrote back. You know, a lot of people retweeted it, like Peter Pronovost retweeted it, Bob Walker, I mean, some pretty big names retweeted it. Uh, but then somebody wrote back and said, poor choice of words, winning, you know, the family didn't win, you know. And I said, okay, you know, I'll give you that. I said, I'm sorry, you know, poor choice of words, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, they learned about it. And so, um, so again, just kind of, you know, you've got to be able to engage and interact and expect some of this pushback. It's not going to be rosy all the time. And if you're out there, people are going to be, uh, 
you know, they're going to ask you questions, and um, and you're going to get occasionally, uh, you know, if you're out there in Twitter, especially uh, right now, people, you're going to attract some attention, um, especially around, you know, even mundane things, you know, like, you know, like I was watching, uh, you know, like I was watching the controversy around going to see Wonder Woman, and uh, you know, people are really getting into it about it. And I'm like, okay, what does that say about gender and leadership and you know, strong women in our culture? Uh, but uh, but I highlight that to say that um, you know, you got to be prepared for for people coming at you. But um, that's why it's very important to stand behind your words. Um, but also to keep in mind that um, it's got to be something you really believe in. And so, and, and also it's okay to apologize, right? Uh, you know, I, I direct social media um, strategy for the Journal of Hospital Medicine, and we run Twitter chats, and, you know, it's kind of a way to grow the voice of social media for journals, you know, um, especially in a time when science is very criticized, right? That's important. Like, how does science really reach the public? And, uh, you know, and I'm not dealing with climate change science, but I'm dealing with science around things like healthcare costs and, you know, utilization in hospitals. Um, and those are polarizing things these days, um, access to care. And I, uh, I wanted to say that, um, you know, recently I, uh, you know, it, this is hilarious, but, you know, we, we started doing these Twitter chats and wrote an article about, you know, social media strategies on, on, uh, on Twitter for the journal. And then, of course, the, the paper was behind a paywall. And, you know, for any of you guys that, that know the community of open source, they were like, Journal of Hospital Medicine, you know, publishes this article, but doesn't, it is not free, we can't see it. And so then, um, so I was like, okay, they have a point, you know, and I emailed the editor-in-chief, who I work for, and he emailed the publisher and said, hey, can we make this article free? So then they made it free for um, a month, and I said, you know, then I was able to tweet back from the account saying, you know, thanks for, thanks for checking us, we have made it free. And then people tweeted back, they respond very quickly, and they're like, Kudos, JHM, for doing this because it was like we were responsive, and I think that's important because, um, you know, uh, you know, people want to know that they're heard, and um, and the more you're listening, and you do occasionally, you know, have a faux pas or say the wrong word, and as long as you say yes, I believe you, I understand, that's important. Now, having said that, there's still trolls out there, and I do have some trolls, and uh, yeah, we just don't worry about it. You know, they're always there. Um, and so I think those are some of the challenges that you face. Um, and um, one of the biggest challenges is time and um, inertia and fear. You know, just do, do I want to get into it this day? Um, and so that's why you have to have, you know, you, a little bit of experimenting is, is the right way to go. And what you might want to do is, um, you know, there are some days where I'm at, very active, and then I kind of die down and see how it goes, and then I'm very active again. So I don't, you know, I'm not a reporter in it for the long run. I really kind of pick and choose my battles carefully, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up and see if anyone else has any questions. Uh, yeah, I have a specific question. Um, I'm on the phone. I couldn't get on the computer. I had a little computer glitch. Uh, David Fisher, I had a kind of a broad question um, is, I guess a lot of us don't have supposedly maybe the position of influence that you do, um, you know, given your title or given some of the, um, the networking or some of the opportunities um, that you've been involved with. So kind of early on, I'm just wondering if you could maybe speak to some of the obstacles, especially it's coming from an academic teaching hospital where it's yeah. kind of encouraged to produce innovation advanced clinical techniques and a lot of options of that, especially trickling down the community. Because from my experience as a patient going through, that's kind of almost stifled, um, especially new clinical technologies and things that insurances won't even cover, um, but they'll cover another, you know, $40,000 surgery with loads of healthcare costs and everything else. It almost, the healthcare system itself is so big, it almost stifles um, innovation. The morning, you know, I guess, kind of broad in terms of clinical care, of process change, organizational change, how some of the barriers being it's so, you know, global and so complex, you know, maybe if you can speak to some of the challenges that you've seen or, you know, small areas where people could make a difference, I guess. 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I, I, I appreciate that academic centers definitely are not the bastion of innovation, but I do think it's changing. And you see a lot of um, early phase startups and industry um, partnerships, and certainly with a decline in NIH budget, you know, especially for research, we've got to think of new models of care and uh, new ways of funding uh, innovation. And so I do think some there's more o doors open for industry. Having said that, a big academic medical center might not be where you start. I often find, uh, you know, I do a lot of work on handoffs, for example. And the groups that are, like, most eager to sign on with, you know, IT vendors and startups are actually in the, um, you know, kind of the smaller hospitals that are kind of have one program or non-teaching hospitals, community hospitals. So I actually think that community hospitals are willing to take a chance. Um, the, you know, the, the bureaucracy in a larger academic teaching hospital is just immense. And so you got to, and oftentimes, like, people, you know, I'm on Twitter, so people will email me or t direct message me being like, I've got a great product that will save your clinicians tons of time and, you know, et cetera. And then I'm like, well, I don't make purchasing decisions for University of Chicago. I'm happy to listen, but, uh, but you really need to talk to our CMIO. And sometimes for the right group, I will forward them along. And so I will say there's a high degree of networking that has to happen. Uh, don't discount the the willingness to go do a face-to-face. -face. I've done a bunch of face-to-faces, and I'm like, oh, great, let's, let's set up a meeting with our chief quality officer and our chief medical officer. And so, um, so I think that's actually an important way in the door. And also, even if you don't get, uh, don't get a sign-in, the person who's on Twitter might be able to be like, well, here's why or here's what you should think. Um, so I've done that a lot for a lot of different groups. And uh, the other thing that I will say is that um, just speaking to faculty and, you know, kind of, uh, this work, um, you know, initially it was very frowned upon. Like, I didn't tell anybody I was on Twitter at all. Like, I didn't even have it as my e -cig. If they discovered I was on Twitter, I was like, okay, that means you're on Twitter too, and you can follow me and I'll follow you, but I'm not going to tell you uh, that I'm on Twitter. And so, um, so that was interesting. And I want to say we all started from somewhere. So even though, you know, you're, this is hilarious, you're like, oh, you have this leadership platform. Uh, you know, I, I was an assistant professor when I started, you know, and so, you can start from anywhere, and uh, there's actually great graduate student Twitter accounts that are, uh, or, you know, this medical student, Sassy MD, you know, who's tweeting her life as a medical student, and she gets, like, so many followers, 10,000 followers, multiple re hundreds of retweets, because she's able to tell it like it is. Now, the same thing with this, uh, there's a Medicaid researcher out there who's a, doing her PhD, and people are really interested in what she has to say because she's young and early in her career. So again, a lead from where you stand. So obviously, if you're not a CEO or CMO, you're not going to be out there tweeting about like value-based purchasing, you know, for your organization that day. But you can tweet about what you're seeing. Um, and I think patient groups have certainly patients have really perfected that and. Uh, just a side story, this past two, blo two weeks when I was on service, it was my first time, you know, I take care of a lot of patients that are, um, that are underserved and don't have a lot of, uh, you know, have low health literacy. I don't take care of a lot of empowered E patients, for example, because I work primarily in the hospital. Uh, having said that, I, I had a patient who was definitely an empowered E patient. Uh, she was posting on Instagram and Twitter, and so she recognized me from Twitter, which was really, really impressive. Um, and so then I, I was checking some of her work out, and uh, she was a patient mm -hmm. advocate. Um, and so it was my first time taking care of somebody who was actually tweeting and Instagramming about the care that I was providing. And so, um, so interestingly, I, I didn't, you know, I. I really, it kind of changed the dynamic, but in a very positive way, because I could get direct feedback on how I was doing. And so, uh, you know, by the end of her stay, uh, you know, I, I knew she was going to go to Florida for her vacation. She really needed to get out of the hospital. And, um, you know, she just had a lot of chronic illness and pain, and so we needed to manage that. Uh, but she was very happy, and she wrote a lovely review of our care. And, um, and so, I, uh, you know, that just gave me some pause to be like, what's the future going to be like? And that's the future, right? She's, she's a millennial and, um, you know, we got to be ready for it. And so I think that this is already happening in the commercial sector. Like, look at the airlines when somebody does something a little bit, um, you know, out there on an airplane uh, or, you know, an airline does something, we hear about it and it's often faced, you know, Facebook Live, Instagram, everything. Uh, we don't do that in healthcare as much because primarily the people we take care of aren't 
there yet, but they're coming, and so we got to be ready for that. And so that's just an aside to say that these skills are going to be important for any career that you have in healthcare. Yes, I had another question kind of branching off of that. Um, when you were talking about the payment system earlier on in the healthcare uh, system and how that informs the cost of certain procedures and whether we do prevention or a uh, kind of reaction to a problem that's happening via surgery. Um, so I was just wondering what you're hoping the Health Activist Network or your social media platform can do to help change that or what the goals are for changing that sort of payment system that we have. Oh, that's great. So I'm going to be really um, a pragma pragmatist, right? Um, I also work, I actually work very closely with Neil Shaw, who's from Cost of Care, who you're going to have on next time. And uh, Neil's a very special person. I actually met him through Twitter, um, and it was kind of around the time I was pivoting, and uh, I'd done a lot around quality and safety, and I was like, wow, really haven't addressed costs in medical education. Uh, maybe I can find somebody who's been doing this as opposed to reinventing the wheel. So I reached out to Cost of Care Twitter account and said, hey, I'm out here trying to teach teach our residents and students about cost of care, do you have a curriculum? And Neil tweeted back and he said, no, but you know, we were invited to apply for a grant and it sounds like you have some background with that. And I was like, I do, I have this grant for another purpose, uh, let's write a grant. So we wrote a grant together and the first time we met each other physically in person was actually at the grantee meeting after the deliverables had been given already. And so just to highlight how that changed my thinking about or who you work with, you know? So I joined the cost of care team. I direct educational initiatives there. And I want to highlight that sometimes my own personal Twitter, um, you know, can't, I can't lift everything with my own personal Twitter. You know, I can make observations, but working with other nonprofits and aligning myself with groups that have a large voice, cost of care also has a very large social media footprint, I can help them. And so, um, one of the things we've done is launch a similar learning network for, for to how to teach value uh, that actually has over 300 educators in it and has actually, we've documented improvement in uptake of um, innovations and have a paper coming out about it. Um, we also have um, developed some new uh, conversation guides and web, uh, web materials on how doctors should have the value conversation. And so when a patient is in front of me and they want an MRI for their back pain, but they haven't tried physical therapy and I know it's against the Choosing Wisely list, how do I have that conversation? So that's a long story to tell you that um, it takes a lot to change healthcare policy. And so I'm, you know, from my academic office, you can see my, uh, you know, my stuff hanging around here. I'm not going to change healthcare policy today, tomorrow, or the next day with what I say on Twitter. It's going to be a long road. But what I can do is change care now, and that's really important uh, because in the meantime, while we wait for healthcare policy to change, I've got patients that are suffering from huge out-of-pocket costs that are not being able to afford their diabetes medications. How can I influence prescriber patterns uh, so that even when we have good policy, people don't pick up some of these things. You know, they don't, uh, they don't write for the best drugs or they might misuse and mistest. So the key is exert impact over what you can control. Now, that doesn't mean that I ignore healthcare policy. I advocate, 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 but I'm not holding my breath. And the reason that I say that's important is that doctors um, in general, and this is a very big generalization, but a lot of times doctors unplug and we're like, I can't change this healthcare policy or, you know, tort reform. We're like, well, you know, as long as malpractice premiums stay high, <laughs> I'm going to have that CT or MRI. When in fact, the research shows that it's not the actual malpractice suits that are actually, you know, the problem. It's the threat, the perceived threat of malpractice, which is in our mind. So our perceived risk in when we're in the ED is what guides over-ordering of cardiac workups, you know? And so a lot of times the variation you see is not because the healthcare insurance market is different or uh, the policy market is different. It's because clinicians have, in, have different, um, you know, ways of dealing with fear and risk. And so that's something we can change. And so um, 
So I say that to say that uh, some of you are working in policy, and kudos to you. I'm counting on you to change it, and I'll help you. And if you need stories, we can bring you stories. If you need, uh, you know, real-life voices, we can do that too. But in the same time, some of you are working sort of adjacent to policy, uh, maybe directly with patients, directly with uh, payers or providers. So from where you sit, how can you solve the problem is what I would say. And so, um, um, and so that's an important thing to think about. My hope, obviously, for healthcare policy is that we, you know, move to uh, to preserve the Affordable Care Act um, and that we actually get to a point where we are able to fix it. Um, I do know patients face skyrocketing premiums. I have the same issue in uh, with some of our patients here. Uh, but at the same time, do we really want to go back in time where we have uninsured patients that really can't get the, their cancer treatment? I don't think so. Um, and so. This is actually going to be a fundamental challenge uh, for our time uh, with the current uh, uh, government that we have. And so what's interesting is pre-election, if you asked me this question, I would have had a very different answer. Post-election, I think that it's very important that we don't lose sight of advocacy because it matters that we call, it matters that we, you know, have our voice heard. But we don't give up if we fail. You know, if something fails in Congress, it's just like, you know, uh, you know, I'm a, in the home of the Obama. So Michelle Obama used to work here, and you know, I I did know her at the time. But she was the one who really advocated for communities solving their problems. And so, uh, and I think that that's really important message that that they are going to carry in their post presidency life, and that we need to indoctrinate as well as advocate that we can solve the problem in front of us, um, in the, and and perhaps inform what the policy should do. And Avindi, this is Robert again. Um, I think of one of the interesting things in your story about how you got involved in not only a local change, but a national change as well, is that you started to attend meetings and you went to uh, the uh, groups that have represented your uh, practice. But what are some of the groups that um, the Health Activist Network members might be interested in uh, getting involved in? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, as a physician trainee, I had I could take advantage of the American College of Physicians, um, and that was really my entree into this and my first time really, you know, experimenting with policy and voice. Um, a lot of other physicians have found that through different specialty societies or AMA or, you know, Doctors for America didn't exist, so that's another group that's come online that a lot of uh, people have uh, really made an impact. And I want to say Doctors for America actually has a lot of members who are not physicians. So I want to put that out there because they are nonpartisan and really believe in uh, access to care. And uh, if you take a look at their platform, I think it will work well. I also think um, in terms of the healthcare policy space that many of you are working in either directly in policy or sort of informing policy um, or in health administration, I want to put a plug in for Academy Health. Um, Academy Health is more of a research arm, but they have a very, very strong health policy arm as well and strong advocacy. And so I think those are groups to get think about getting involved in. If you've never been to an Academy Health meeting, they have a health policy meeting in D.C. in the fall that I think is very rich and sort of you get to hear from policymakers and people at CMS and um, and also network. And so then you can kind of think, well, you know, where do I want to be? And um, I've met people that are like, you know, that mm -hmm. started out is, uh, you know, working for other groups, and now they're doing their own startups in Medicaid innovation and really uh, health IT. Uh, so there's a lot of space there for, uh, you know, whenever there's a big problem to solve, there's a lot of different solutions, and then with that come a lot of different paths and a lot of different job opportunities. Um, so if we had this all figured out, we wouldn't need all of us, right? Um, so I think that that's, those are some groups to start thinking about. Um, and then I also think uh, another one a plug that I wanted to make, and I'm actually on, a, on the board for the uh, media board, uh, media advisory board for the IHI, is the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And so I think um, if, if you've never been to this conference, it's over 6,000 people, all clinicians and healthcare policymakers, administrators, variety of different people, all focusing on how to improve quality, safety, and value of care using quality improvement techniques. And uh, this is the group that Don Berwick started, who was the former head of CMS. 
and um, and so they've had a major impact on um, on the discussion. And so just to give you an example, people who've actually chaired their meeting or been prominent speakers include Atul Gawande before the McAllen, Texas paper. Um, and, um, and actually Neil's been very involved as well. We've done a lot of work with them. And so I think the great thing about the IHI is it's not encumbered by policy, right? The IHI is really about how do you empower the people around you to take control of the situation? And they actually think about change agent method, messages to do that in healthcare, which I think is important because, you know, burnout's an issue and um, I think it's an issue for all of us, especially with this barrage of email and fake news and things coming our way. You know, how do you pick what to respond to? Um, so those are just some examples of, um, of groups that I would uh, take a look at. Um, and I think that that's, I also think that that's important for me because as a clinician, I go to those groups to meet you and it's nice for you to go to the groups to meet clinicians because I think when we all start talking to each other, um, that's when change happens, right? One of the di most difficult challenges in healthcare is we got a lot of people on the admin side who don't work clinically. And so you kind of need that clinical IQ, so to speak, to be able to go and think about the next policy or to be like, let me, you know, what, what proposal should we fund? Oh, that's not feasible. That's the kind of reality check that you get from working with clinicians. And so, um, so some of the most successful things that I think that have happened in organized medicine have been when you bring together experts in the health policy side with clinicians to think about these innovations. And, you know, an example is um, the AAMC uh, Association of American Medical Colleges has this hot spotting initiative that's based on Jeff Brenner's work out of Camden Coalition that was highlighted at um, through the Atul Gawande article. Um, and then another group, ACP, has been very powerful with their vice president of governmental affairs, Bob Doherty, who's you know, basically been a lobbyist for, you know, over 40 years, but his voice matters. And so when he talks about AHCA, people listen, and other primary care physicians can be like, yeah, we, see, we, we believe what he says, and so, you know, we're going to help him. And so he's based in D.C. We are not. But if we can channel him and, you know, highlight what he's saying, it's really important. And so I think having those leaders out there for us to grab onto when we work in our daily work is critical, and, and I think all of you are poised to be that person. Actually, so Vinny, I have a question also. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, clinicians and policymakers. Well, how do we work interdisciplinary with, with um, people in other fields? We're very siloed currently, I think. Um, yeah. So we, I know a lot of a lot of people in our network are also social workers and, you know, business people. And, um, I mean, I could go on pharmacists and all these things. Oh, What's great. the what and advice? I do a lot of so I want to say that if you're in that space, uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvements, it's like so open. It's, you know, it's been led by nurses. Uh, there's, it's, it's really a variety of different groups in health. And so I would say physicians may even be in the minority there. So I think that that's a group to definitely look at. Another group to think about is the Art of Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Initiative, which many of you may be uh, may know intimately or be a part of. Um, I think RWJ has really taken the lead in sort of highlighting that we are all in this together. And it's not just health practitioners. It's, you know, urban health planning and, you know, education and schools and transportation and how are we going to um, make sure that, you know, in my community in the south side of Chicago, how are we make sure that crime rates fall so that seniors can get out there and actually walk around um, and get healthy food? Um, so we're all in it together, and I think RWJ is another really great um, group to follow. Definitely follow them on Twitter. Uh, they have culture of health meetings, um, and so that way you can kind of decide, well, is that the group you want to be part of? APHA, American Public Health Association, is another great interdisciplinary group that a lot of people that that welcomes people that have MPHs or not in any field. And so the nice thing is, if you're working in this public health space, um, you know I think that's a great meeting to learn about what's new and upcoming and sort of join interest groups. And so I think for any of you, you know, you've got to find the receptor of your work. And so uh, how do you join in, in, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, that's how Academy Health has interest groups. So if you're working in women's health, you can join the women's health interest group and meet Neil, you know. Um, and so similarly, they have a workforce 
you know, interest group. So I can be part of the workforce interest group and meet um, Ed Salzberg, who's one of the senior policymakers in that area. And so one of those things about interest groups is sort of level, levels the playing field where you can actually meet in person with some of the people that are actually rainmakers in that area. And they're usually just so generous with their time at the meeting because they have time there. Um, but then, you know, I do think even though I've talked a lot about social media, there is something about face-to-face -face that does help in the fact that you invest in going to a meeting. Um, and then actually being a leader of an interest group, wow, you get to know a lot of people that way. And so, like, you know, start out small, but you could, you'll could you find easily that interest groups often need leaders or co-leaders, and those are the types of things you can volunteer to do. Um, and, um, and, and that's where I think the, the, the magic happens, right? Because you got to find your people. Some of these meetings are so large that you're like, where am I going to find my people? But then you find the interest group and you're like, okay, you know, I'm interested in, you know, healthcare disparities in this space and, you know, okay, these are my people. And so that's kind of where I would say um, you can look on. Uh, Twitter has some great um, ways to do that too. It's like find your people through hashtags. And so there's something called the Healthcare Hashtag Project where, you know, you can search for hashtags that are tweeted or meetings and then you can be like, oh, okay, this seems like a group that's tweeting about something I'm interested in or they have a tweet chat. Let me belong to this tweet chat or just tweet on the tweet chat or lurk. And then you can start following the people that tweet in that area, and then they'll get to know you, right, because you might tweet with them or you might tweet as well. You might index your, ha your tweets with that hashtag so that community sees it. So, so virtual or not, you know, there is this thing about finding your people, and so that's what I'll say about cost of care. It's like I found my people. I mean, I was working in a meta-ed circle, but I was like needing more people that were interested in cost of care and healthcare delivery, and so I had something to add to cost of care, and so it was like a mutual relationship, and I could join as a, you know, part of this nonprofit. So a lot of times there is like space for you to volunteer, and um, and I often say that this is really funny, you know, uh, you, you know, this is a really interesting phrase. I, I'm I'm embarrassed to say Gwyneth Paltrow is the owner of this phrase, but um, so I'm not a believer in some of the things she does out there in the in the alternative medicine universe. But uh, she said something like, sometimes you do things for money. And sometimes you do things for love. And so she did the movie Shallow Hal for money, and she did the movie Royal Tenenbaums for love. And I highlight that to say that to all people I mentor, you have to balance your life, and you have to also, you know, be able to sustain your life and live. And so there are going to be times where perhaps you're working for the money or you're kind of in a job where you're more, um, you're like, maybe this isn't directly aligned my, with my mission. And with all jobs, there's, you know, kind of the scut work. Um, and so that's sort of the money part. But then it's oftentimes like find the thing you love and you do it. You often do it for free. But if, is there a way to incorporate it into your job? That's that's like the holy grail. It's not going to happen right away. A lot of young people are like, well, I want to do this right away. And I was like, you kind of do have to kind of get your foot in the door, and many of you have gotten your foot in the door, and then you're realizing, okay, maybe I'm out here doing more admin clerical work, and I want to be out there doing the policy work or be out there doing the thought leader work. Um, you can slowly move. You know, but it requires a, it requires mentorship as well as sort of the will to kind of volunteer. And that's what I would say, um, you know, social media sort of levels the playing field very quickly because all of a sudden your boss might be like, oh, you know, this senior leader from Academy Health mentioned that they follow you. And then you're, and then you're like, yeah, you know. And so I think that's something to kind of think about is you can use social media as part of your professional development as well. Um, and that actually improves your standing in your group um, and your firm, your company, whatever it is, because you're influential. So um, it sounds like, you know, I know people are like, oh, how did you get here? I was like, everyone started somewhere. And so, um, it, and it's one of those things that it very much levels the playing field, but you get what you put in. So you have to definitely find your voice and think about well, what am I gonna follow and tweet about so that I'm gonna make an impact. That was a great answer, thank you. I appreciate that one. Um, are there any other questions from anyone else on, that has joined us online? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Vinny, for joining us today and helping us kick off these virtual meetings for the Health Activist Network. I think um, your experiences that you've shared with us and, and through that spotlight post have, 
it was just uh, very inspiring. I think every time I talk to you, I'm like, oh, I, I leave a little bit more inspired. Um, and I just want to highlight. I just want to highlight, like, um, like Vinny mentioned earlier, our next virtual meeting is with Neil Shaw. It is Wednesday, July 15th, at the same time from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern time, and if you're elsewhere, um, Central time will be 11 to 12. And uh, please RSVP through our website on the healthactivistnetwork.org. Um, I'm going to pass it over. Does Robert, do you have anything to add to this? Um, I don't have anything else to add except um, in about a week or so, uh, we will have an advisor uh, spotlight of Anil Shah on our Health Activist Network as well. Um, so each time we have these virtual meetings, we will be um, highlighting the health reform advisor on the Health Activist Network site so that you can uh, get a sense of how they got to where they are t today and uh, their advice for is the next group uh, who will be following in their path. All right. Well, thank you again, Vinny, for your time. I know uh, you're busy, thank you. and we love having you. Yeah, no, it's great, and uh, I look forward to your tweets or questions. I'm happy to engage um, at any time, and uh, and I think that you guys are on well on your way as part of the healthcare activist network.